Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Vyacheslav. Uh, it's not on the slides. Uh, too hard to spell even for me. Uh, so uh, I'm here to... I was supposed to be here to give this talk, but when I was starting, I started to make slides, I realized that uh, I actually want to give a slightly different talk. Uh, so I changed... This is very shaky, but okay. I changed uh, the title. Uh, so I'm going to be talking here about my uh, experience uh, for the past six years with some brief uh, excursions into uh, other projects. Uh, uh, for the past six years, I worked on the Dart programming language, uh, mostly on the uh, virtual machine side of it, mostly on the compiler part of the virtual machine. Uh, and I want to share some of the uh, developments and insights uh, from this uh, time. Uh, how many people here know what Dart is to begin with? Okay, so everybody who showed up actually knows what Dart is. Okay, that explains it. Uh, so before I joined Google, I worked on some uh, Java uh, compiler, Java virtual machine, and then I joined Google and worked on V8. Uh, and I had a brief uh, time when I worked at, on Luajit at Google. But most of the time, uh, since 2012, I work on a Dart VM. And that's my spirit animal up there in the corner. So, okay, Dart was released in 2011 uh, as a as a language which was supposed to fix web development. At least that's what uh, people who uh, made it, who designed it, thought uh, it's gonna do. Uh, and uh, everybody here uh, knows uh, what Dart is. Almost everybody. But for the benefit of people who will be watching the recording. I'm still going to show a couple of slides uh, uh, about Dart uh, to show a bit of a problematic side of Dart, I would say. Uh, so this is a completely valid code uh, in Dart 1. Uh, it would uh, compile and it would run. Uh, maybe it would throw uh, a runtime error. But maybe it would not throw. Maybe it would even actually print something valid. So uh, Dart 1 was an extremely dynamic language. Uh, it's essentially kind of a small talk wrapped into a C syntax, uh, because that's what the original designers of the language thought uh, is a good programming model. And the types in the program have no meaning, uh, except for kind of a link tools. Uh, that you can throw on top and validate your uh, program ahead of time. But in runtime, they were completely thrown down and thrown out, and they would not influence the runtime behavior of the program. So it was a, a bit of a strange language. Uh, so, uh, and the, the reason for doing Dart like that was that dynamic languages, uh, they are believed to be very good for fast uh, iterative development. Uh, and they also believe not to be so good for maintenance later. Uh, so the idea was that you will combine this kind of uh, type system uh, thrown on top of a dynamic language uh, to have a maintainability, but also very fast development. And, uh, well, the intent was good. I don't know whether the execution was good or not. Uh, the history apparently shows that uh, people prefer more static languages, but I will talk about that a bit later. So, people who designed Dart originally, they worked on uh, various VMs in their life, and they uh, worked on Smalltalk VMs originally, and then they worked on Hotspot. So, of course, they designed the language in a way that it's very easy and very uh, efficiently can be implemented using uh, just-in-time compilation. That was the idea. And uh, uh, when the VM was originally made, uh, it, was, it had just the AST-based uh, JIT compiler, which took an abstract syntax tree produced by the parser, and it compiled it uh, into the machine code, uh, one path code generation. Uh, how many people here have any background in compilers so that I can also, OK. That's, then I, I will also bypass some of the explanations, and people who watch, I guess, will have to study something <laughs> on the side, <clears throat> post the video. So, okay. 
I have uh, 150 slides to go through, so I will, uh, I, will, uh, I will have to bypass some explanations, otherwise we will never finish. Um, okay, so in 2012, uh, the decision was made to start a new JIT compiler because obviously the AST-based one-pass code generation only gets you so far. Uh, and uh, I joined the project then with a couple of other people. All three of us, uh, we came from V8. We worked on uh, uh, the crankshaft, which was an optimizing compiler for V8 for a long time. And we brought some of the insights that we got uh, from there and uh, started working on a new JIT compiler. Uh, and uh, the recipe for doing JIT compilers for dynamic languages these days is, is well known to everybody. And it has been well known since 90s. So I'm not going to, uh, if you have all, all of you have background, I'm not going to tell you something that you don't know. Uh, you take some sort of uh, type feedback, runtime feedback, uh, collection infrastructure, and you uh, put some speculation on top, and you have some optimized, re-optimized uh, uh, machinery, and that's it. You have the best JIT you can ever make. Nobody can make a better JIT. So uh, it's like all the JITs, if you look at them, they are built in the same way. The, the way they collect feedback might be different. The way they uh, apply speculations may be different, but the architecture is always the same. Even tracing JITs are essentially the same stuff. It's just the granularity of what you compile and how you compile it is different. Um, so here's some assembly uh, on the slide. So the, 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 the way you collect feedback in the, in the Dart VM it's very simple. Uh, so let's start at the top instruction. No, so okay. Uh, I have a high level description. So each call site in the program has two things associated with it. Uh, you have some sort of a data structure on the site which will contain the mapping about uh, the classes uh, of the receivers uh, that were observed at this call site and the targets of the method invocation. So for example, we got a real doc class. It will be recorded that there was a real doc class, and the method invocation went and hit this particular method in the doc class hierarchy. And, uh, and you have a, a piece of code that performs uh, a sort of a ca cached lookup. It checks whether something is already in the cache. Uh, if it's not in the cache, then you need to do a generic lookup. And uh, otherwise, you just reuse the, what's already in the cache. And the idea here is that looking up through the class hierarchy might be expensive, might involve a lot of lookups. And if you just check if something in the cache, that's much faster. So you replace, uh, you apply essentially the technology for optimization that is well known. It's like memoization, no, no, no different from that. So uh, I'm going to illustrate how it works. Uh, so you, you, you got a real doc uh, with a method woof. Uh, so initially you arrive, the cache is empty, you go to the slow lookup, uh, which then goes and updates the cache, and you in the cache have uh, the fact that if you see uh, ever again an uh, instance of a doc, then this is the method that you should be invoking. And there is also a counter which counts uh, how often have you seen this particular class, which will be helpful in optimizations later because you can use some frequency-based uh, algorithms to decide like you, how you schedule the code or how you align the branches in the decision tree and so on and so forth. So, and you, if you come again, you just hit the cache and you increment the counter and you invoke the method and that's it, so on and so forth. Uh, so if you suddenly get a wolf, which a uh, completely unrelated class, but because Dart is a dynamically typed language, Dart1 is a dynamically typed language, you can use completely unrelated classes in the, in the, in the same call site. So you come, you look at the cache, it's not in the cache. So you hit the slow path, you update the cache, and now that suddenly there is a wolf and it has only occurred once, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is how the type profiling works in Dart VM. Uh, so what happens if you later observe that some code is hot? Like you have some call site uh, in some method, and this is a hot method because you can see here it was invoked at least a thousand times. Uh, so you come and you invoke a compiler and you start optimizing. Uh, and the, you use the type feedback to feed 
information to your compiler, and the compiler then says, well, I only saw docs there, so I will just insert a check there, which checks if it's a doc or not, and uh, I will just do a static call, like no dynamic dispatch to the method, and, and that's it. Of course, it's a speculative optimization. You don't know if it's going to be true or not. So you also have some machinery for going back to unoptimized code and stuff like that. So this is all uh, fundamentally primitive stuff. Uh, this is classical stuff, like uh, Bach is a classical music. This is a Bach of uh, JIT compilers. Uh, this is a paper from 1991 by the titans uh, of compilation, the Urs Holzle, uh, Craig Chambers, and David Unger, uh, who describe roughly all the same stuff. And uh, it was applied in self, it was applied in small talk. Uh, Lars Bach, who started uh, both V8 and Dart, unsurprisingly worked with Urs Holzle uh, on, on one of the startups uh, they did before, well, before Lars went to Sun Microsystems and later to Google. Um, okay. So, but it is a surprisingly general uh, optimization. When we started applying it to Dart, we first were a little bit confused how to use it in certain places. Because originally, when you look at it, you think, oh, it's just about method calls. But then it turns out many things are actually can be looked at like they are method call, even though they don't look like one. So uh, for example, Dart has this interesting feature. So from the call side, you don't actually know whether that's a method call or it's a field access and the field contains a closure. So previously I showed you the cases where the, there was a class doc and it had the method woof. But here it's a class alien, it's an alien doc, and uh, instead of a method woof it contains a field which you can put a closure in and then the code above should continue to work just the same. It should invoke this method or in, in this closure and uh, it should print uh, stuff. So how do you cache results of this, for example? Another interesting feature of Dart is that there is an inverse situation. Something looks like a field access, but it is actually a, a creation of a closure. So Dart has this shorthand where if you have a method on the class, you can tear it off. And tearing it off uh, binds it to the instance of the class. So it's like if you programmed in the in JavaScript, it's like dot .bind or stuff like that. It's like if you th think that method is carried stuff, then it's like applying it once, special application. Anyway, so uh, this feature, again, it looks like a field access, but it's actually something else. You create a closure there. Uh, and finally, there are these no such method invocations because you can have something that looks like a method call, but there are no methods in the class. And instead, there is a no such method thing which captures all the invocations. How do you cache that? So we come there, the cache is empty. We go to look up and cache. There is no method. We can do something to invoke the no such method, but there is actually no real method to invoke. Like It has completely different uh, signature. Uh, so you cannot really cache it. So you, n there is nothing to put in into the cache. So instead, you just uh, continue going and going and going into this runtime thing, and that's where you performance just completely disappears. So we started looking at it, and then we asked ourselves, is there anything that we could actually put into that cache? And then we said, well, we are JIT compiler system, so we can actually also generate kind of a Dart code as well and inject it into the definition of a class. And here we inject the, the thing that just forwards to the no such method. And as soon as you have some dynamically injected method, now you can actually cache it in the, in the cache, and uh, you put it in, and everything just continues to work from there. And when I say everything, it's like if your whole compilation pipeline is based on this type feedback, suddenly inliner will come, and it will look at the cache, and okay, we invoke in only this method, so I can maybe inline it, and then you inline it, then you do some constant forwarding, uh, load uh, to store forwarding, store to load, and suddenly everything disappears. Like that if will disappear, and you just you are left with a print statement. The overhead of this no such method completely evaporated. Uh, okay, so 
what I told you now in these 47 slides was basically the work we have done in 2012, 2013. Uh, and the JIT at that point was kind of done. It was doing a good job. Uh, we did a few non-classical optimizations because previously what I showed you was essentially either classical optimization, so bending your worldview in a way which uh, allows you to, uh, to use classical optimizations for slightly non-classical things. So we looked at the code that our compiler generates and uh, we observed that, uh, I mean, by doing this sort of speculative optimizations, you add checks on the use sites usually, because when you invoke something on, on a, an object of unknown type, and you cannot establish the type of this object some, using some local uh, type propagation, uh, then you are forced to put some sort of a check in there, which will cause the optimization if it's, it does not uh, hold. So we started thinking about how to move these checks from the use side to the definition, because usually in a place where this value comes from, uh, you know what type it has. Uh, like, and one good example is uh, values that come from fields. A lot of values actually come from fields. And when you create objects, uh, yeah, so check at use. When you create objects and you fill the fields, you usually know what you are putting in those fields uh, in one way or another. Either you copy them from other fields or you create them right there. Uh, so we decided to assign a bit of a state to each field in the, each class. And that state uh, captures a, what kind of values are stored into this field across all objects in the heap. So if we ever read from this field, what kind of state can we get? And we uh, record three types of information, a concrete class of a value, whether it's a null or not, potentially, because Dart is, is a language with null, unfortunately, and, and all values are nullable. And we also uh, record lengths of an array, if, if there is an array always stored into this uh, field, because that allows you to eliminate bounce checks. Uh, and uh, when we have a load, we just look, is there some state recorded for this field? And uh, use this information to eliminate uh, any checks at the use of the field. And when you store, you need to update this state and you need to de-optimize the code that depends on it if you are doing an incompatible update. Uh, but the observation here is that when you are storing, usually you can eliminate these checks because you know the type of what you are storing in, in one way or another. So uh, the overhead kind of disappears and overhead from the uses also disappears. So in this particular example, we would know that uh, one of the fields is always uh, non-null doc uh, and has no lengths. I mean, docs have different lengths. Uh, and uh, for the list of docs, you know that it's always a list, it's always non-null, and it has 10 elements. So if you ever have an access to this uh, list with an index that is a constant or known because of the range analysis, it tells it's a range between, one and, uh, between 0 and 9, uh, then... Uh, you don't need to do a bounce check. Okay. So, yeah, that's the summary of this optimization. In 2013, five years ago, in exactly this room, I, told, I gave a talk uh, about the, our experience building the, the JIT for Dart. I mostly focus on V8, though, and uh, how we did not do the mistakes uh, we did in the V8. So if you are curious, to, uh, to, you can go check this talk. Uh, Okay, 2014 we spent mostly just tweaking things. Uh, we did not do much, just improving the optimizations, no real innovation. Uh, we started this uh, say no to the handwritten assembly effort in 2014 because uh, in, the, in the Dart VM we had this compiler on the side and we had some uh, code that was written in assembly by hand. And usually, if you have handwritten assembly, that's where all the bugs would be. You want to update some calling convention somewhere. Suddenly, some register is used in a, in a place where you did not expect. And you have a bug which happens once in a while because somebody is using the wrong register. So we started uh, porting all our uh, handwritten assembly to, the, uh, to use the compiler itself. Because, well, you have this optimizing compiler which you say, 
it's great at optimizing things. Well, then you should be eating your own dog food uh, and uh, actually using it to produce the code that you are writing by hand as well. And uh, I think a lot of the virtual machines are actually moving in the same direction, like V8 is using the, uh, the code stub assembler these days, it's called, uh, to generate their stubs and intrinsics. We plan to move our stubs, and when I say stubs, it's just a piece of assembly code, which uh, is not like a, doesn't correspond to a function in the Dart uh, program, it's just an auxiliary piece of assembly code. Uh, we started to move them too, but then we had to abandon it because we got distracted with some, by some other projects. We also did e reg export, uh, and uh, e reg exp is a, uh, do I have a slide of that? So yeah, so e reg exp uh, is a, is a re regular expression engine which originally came from V8. Uh, when we started Dart VM, uh, we did not use that because it's completely ingrained into the V8 internals. Uh, so we just use uh, PCRE, which uh, is okay, but it's slow and uh, uh, maybe it was slow, maybe they fixed it, I don't know. Uh, and it also does not completely match the JavaScript semantics of regular expressions. Uh, so we decided that we want to use the regexp because it's good and it's fast and it matches the JavaScript semantics. But we did not want to take its backend. And the, the way regexp is written is that it takes regular expression and produces some intermediate representation of a regular expression and then it compiles it to machine code. And that compilation to machine code was completely platform specific. So if you have MIPS backend, you need to write it by hand in MIPS assembly. Well, uh, we are not a big fans of that. Uh, so the way we did it uh, is we just generated the compiler intermediate representation uh, from the intermediate representation of the regular expression compilation engine. And this way we only had to take the front part of it and the middle part of it, and backends we got for free. And the performance uh, is quite acceptable. It's not as fast sometimes as uh, V8, because V8 has hand-allocated registers and everything like that, uh, and we did not do anything like that in, in the Dart VM version. And we actually even start from unoptimized version of regular expression, then we, it warms up and optimizes it, uh, even though the types are kind of known statically. Uh, so you have this, if you use the same regular expression a lot of times, then you see how the performance goes like that, uh, but it starts slower. So, but it was a quick intern project essentially, and it just shows that if you have uh, a high level compiler which can take some high level representation, well, it's better to use that instead of writing assembly. Uh, okay. So, Somewhere on the, in the beginning of the presentation, I, uh, I have said that, well, Dart was supposed to be a web development language, and I'm talking and talking about the VM. Uh, well, how does it even work? Because no, VA, no, no browser actually includes the virtual machine. Uh, well, the way it worked is that uh, there are two ways to run uh, Dart code. There is a native way, which we hoped that some browsers would use but that did not come to pass. So there is a fallback way. Uh, you can compile to JavaScript. And as we were evolving the virtual machine, uh, the Dart2GS compiler compilation technology was also evolving. So it started in this uh, AST-based compiler written in Java, uh, which obviously was uh, not so uh, amazing. Then there was a, we like cool names like Dart, Frog, Frog was the, this attempt to compile uh, Dart to JavaScript without actually respecting its semantics. Uh, that's why I say it's transpiler, because I hate the word transpiler, and I think that uh, if, you call your, if you are working on transpiler, that usually means that you are using regular expressions to compile your uh, <laughs> stuff. So, search and replace. Uh, so then there was the leg of a frog, which was the... SSA-based, CFG, SSA-based uh, compiler written in Dart, and then because uh, people were very confused about the naming, like they were like, should I use Froxy or Lexi or what is the happening? So we rename it to Dart2GS. So. And it's a big ahead of time compiler with SSA uh, type flow analysis inside, which takes forever to compile Dart programs. And that's not because it's a bad compiler, it's because actually if you look at the language, you realize that 
it's so dynamic and so flexible that compiling it ahead of time is hard. You just don't have the type information. So you need to run some sort of analysis to derive this type information. And usually those analyses, they don't scale very well. Uh, and you have a problem that uh, the language you are targeting, it neither matches your source language, so you cannot do this regular expression style compilation, uh, nor it has enough flexibility for you to erase or like represent these uh, mismatches in the efficient way, because it's JavaScript, right? So, okay. So, in 2014, something interesting happened, which we did not expect. Uh, in the sky has opened. So the, a group of people on the Chrome team originally, uh, they uh, departed on a very interesting experiment. Uh, they thought well, there are a lot of mobile uh, web, well, there are a lot of frameworks for developing mobile applications which would work across iOS and Android, but all of them are a bit lacking in different parts. So there are, there are, for example, web view based frameworks where you just use uh, web technology and you wrap it in an app. Uh, or there are native ones where you just have to write essentially two applications. Uh, and they said, well, what if we take a web view technology? Because that's what we worked on. We worked for like tens of years on the, uh, on the optimizing the rendering pipelines in, in the browsers. And we actually strip away all the legacy all the CSS, all the HTML and stuff like that, and you just are left with the core of the layout and uh, rendering the raw uh, bits or textures. And how fast that can be, how small that can be. And uh, they started working on that, and uh, uh, it was called Sky originally, and uh, it actually used JavaScript in the beginning because they just started with Chrome, and then they started cutting things down, down, down. Eventually, they cut the JavaScript out and put Dart in. Amazing. Uh, and the C++ is still there, uh, but it's only used for the lowest parts of the system where you push the stuff to the GPUs, uh, essentially. But the layout and the like, scene rendering, the upper parts of it, are all done in Dart. Um, and they renamed it to Flutter, so that's the Flutter. Uh, so if you never heard about Flutter, how many people heard about Flutter? Oh, everybody. I'm not telling you anything new, so okay. Uh, so there was also a talk in 2017 on Strange Loop, uh, uh, very uh, modestly named, uh, Framework of the Tomorrow. You should check it out. It's a great talk, and Eric is a great speaker. Okay, so you figured out already by now that this is a mobile uh, development framework. Okay. But that also means that we have an interesting challenge here because uh, there are two major uh, operating systems for mobile phones, uh, Android and iOS. Uh, and Android is great. It allows you to take your Dart VM, put it in, and off you go. Uh, iOS does not, unless you're a mobile Safari. Then you're assigned in a special way, and then you can do jitting. Uh, and this is a security measure, so I can understand that. Maybe not, but uh, okay. Uh, so, and, and that creates a problem for us because we have this amazing mobile uh, development framework based on Dart, but we cannot run it on iOS because our Dart uh, to native uh, compilation technology is all just in time based. So, uh, we need an ahead of time solution. Uh, so, in 2015, uh, uh, me and another uh, colleague of mine. Uh, we started working on the prototype of an AOT compiler. And uh, the, uh, the observation that we made when we started working on it is that, well, actually, we already have a lot of interesting pieces in place because we generate this JIT code, and this JIT code doesn't actually embed any pointers into the garbage collected heap. There is an indirection in between uh, called an object pool. And uh, that means that the JIT code is reallocatable. Uh, you just uh, you save the JIT code, and then you just when you load it, you need to hook it up to the right pool, and off you go. There is still a little bit of uh, complexity because you cannot have the pointer to the object pool in the instructions themselves, like it was uh, originally, uh, because you're going to mark the instructions regions read-only. Uh, so you have to do some massaging and stuff like that, change the calling conventions. 
which actually regressed the performance of the JIT because we, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we did not want to have uh, flags that say, are, are we compiling for the ART, uh, then use this calling convention, or are we compiling for the JIT, use this calling conventions, because we thought, if you don't have these flags, then it's easier to test the code, because then you test the same calling convention across all the modes of execution. So, but it was a mistake in this respect because it regressed the JIT performance. So, and once you fixed all of this stuff and your code became completely relocatable, you just write it out. And we already had the technology for that called snapshots. It's like a, you take a heap dump of your VM and then you can hydrate it back if you need it. Uh, so we hooked this all up together, uh, except there is a problem. The JIT compiler is lazy and it generates uh, speculative code, right? Uh, so how do we get the code to serialize? Like we have this technology to serialize the code, but you don't have the code anymore, any, yet, let's say. Because when you start the Dart program, nothing is actually compiled. It's compiled as it is being executed. So, well, the solution, again, is very simple. You just disable speculations, all that you can find. Uh, and then you force compile everything starting from the root of like main and then you go around and you touch everything that can potentially be executed. Okay. And it was actually a very fast uh, thing to do like because we already had so many pieces in place and we had this powerful compilation pipeline and so on and so forth. Uh, so only two, three months we already had an AOT compiler in hand and we could run stuff on iOS. Well, of course, in reality, it took another probably four to six months to make a real product out of it. Uh, so, because, as you remember, AT compilation of Dart to JavaScript is hard, and no matter where you go, you actually have problem because of the Dart semantics. You need to have some solutions for this dynamism and be, uh, be able to eliminate it or alleviate the cost of dynamism in the, in the code that you generate. Okay, so the, the JIT compensated for this dynamism using speculative uh, optimization. So you need, to, uh, and you disable that part. So you need to replace it with something. Uh, so the solution for the, uh, for, the, for the first version of AT compiler that we had uh, was uh, to essentially use kind of inline caching in the AT generated code. And uh, uh, as you remember, you have these two pieces attached to each call side. Uh, in reality, they are, access through the indirection, as I described before, which means that you can patch them as you run the, the thing. You cannot patch or update the code, but you can write, patch uh, these two pieces for each call site, uh, meaning that you can uh, change the states of this uh, call site as you're executing and you're observing what's happening. And it's, again, very classical thing, so I'm not going to stop on it also because I'm running off time, out of time, right? Yeah, I have three, seven minutes. Uh, so I will just skip all these slides. We also did the, uh, some inlining for arithmetic because in Dart you would say, oh, arithmetic should be simple. But in reality, in Dart you can overwrite operators. So if you see a plus in the program, that doesn't mean it's an arithmetic at all. It can be, I don't know, least concatenation. Uh, uh, int type is nullable. And uh, int also has arbitrary precision. So you can take one shifted by a thousand shifted back. You still need to get one. Uh, so there is some assembly. You can look at it when I publish the slides. It doesn't really matter. But you just put some fast paths for the arithmetic operation, and then on the slow uh, section of the code far away from the uh, hot path, you put some generic uh, fallback. Nothing special, really. Uh, OK. And we added on top a little bit of closed world optimizations. No real type flow analysis, because we ba base this uh, technology on our JIT. So it's essentially kind of ahead of time JIT with some uh, per method optimizations, but no really good uh, closed world uh, type flow, for example. Okay. There is an interesting problem that you hit when you compile ahead of time, is that you really want to have small binaries. Uh, you don't want to have a lot of, for example, fallback code, otherwise you could just generate fast path everywhere and then slow path everywhere. You want to have a generic code which is reasonably fast and reasonably small. Uh, we got an interesting benefit from this indirection. Because uh, if you think about it, then all methods, like all non-inline, non-specialized call sites, uh, they look all exactly the same, given that you have the same registers uh, for the doc and stuff like that. Uh, so if you look at these two functions, in, and you assume that they cannot be specialized in any way, then they actually compile to exactly the same machine code. 
So you can share that code in the resulting binary. And the only thing that is different is the object pool content. So uh, that cuts the binary size quite considerably, at least by uh, 10 to 20 percent. The byproduct of the AOT work was uh, uh, a very interesting side effect is that we can now warm up an application, then save the state of a heap, and then start from there, which cuts on the warm up costs for the programs that run in the JIT mode. OK. Uh, but only so much can be done. And only so much can be said in five minutes, but I will try. Uh, so in 2016, the wind started blowing the wind of changes for Dart. Uh, it was observed that Dart to JS is very slow for the development cycles. If you are developing in the browser, if you use Dart to JS, you will die before the uh, large program is compiled. Uh, so they, they, they have been cooking on the website a separate compiler, which uh, uh, was supposed to do fast modular compilations. Uh, but those fast modular compilations, they require a richer type system because you cannot really compile modularly and produce reasonable size and performance code if you know nothing about the types in the whole program. So they said, what if uh, Dart was a reasonable programming language like Java? Uh, no, not really like that, but uh, yeah. So what if the writing that variable is a doc actually guaranteed that variable is a doc? What if having a list of cats actually guaranteed that there is a cat inside? Uh, none of which was true for Dart 1. Uh, so there is a talk from 2018 uh, on the Dart Conf by Leif Patterson, who some of you might know as a person who worked on the Intel Haskell compiler at some point. Uh, so all the insinuations about Java type system are not completely true. But anyway, so uh, there is a talk about the evolution of the Dart language. Uh, so, and there was another problem with the Dart ecosystem is that every Dart tool uh, had its own Dart parser, basically. So everybody started from Dart source, and then if you're VM, then you parse it. If you are Dart to JS, you parse it. If you're Dart analyzer, you parse it, and then off you go. Uh, which created considerable complexity if you want to evolve the language and you want to change to a new type system. Suddenly, you need to fix a lot of different parsers uh, and stuff like that. So we started a project to unify it and make like single binary AST representation, which can be shared between different backends and tools and so on. So. Migration started in 2016, and then for nothing but two years we did this migration. So we worked on nothing else, essentially, and it uh, turned out to be a complete uh, sinkhole of uh, engineering time, and which we didn't expect. Uh, but uh, in retrospect, uh, doing two migrations at the same time to a new type system and to a new compilation infrastructure is hard. Uh, so tons of gnarly work. Uh, but we did some cool work as well, too, because uh, moving some stuff into Dart, like we started parsing Dart in Dart, uh, allowed us to also do, for VM, optimization passes in Dart, for example. So that was cool, because C++ is not the most pleasant language to write code in. Uh, the AOT in Dart 2 became simpler. Uh, but still there are problems, because uh, primitive types are still nullable, uh, the int became from a big integer to a 64-bit integer, but on 32-bit platforms you still uh, have a problem with that because you, you need to represent it as a pair and stuff like that. Uh, and the soundness requires type checks. So it's a soundness because, like, well, it's a reasonable type system for the, which was retrofitted on the tons of an existing code. So you couldn't just make it completely strict. You had to do some stuff. Uh, I'm gonna, I have two minutes, so I'll try to tell you this. So, uh, Dart has covariant generics, and if you have covariant generics, you have to check. So if you have a program in Java, you know that if you have covariant arrays, you store into array, you get a store exception if the array of the wrong type. Uh, the same in Dart, except all generics are covariant. Uh, welcome to my world. And there is also a still dynamic functionality in Dart, so you can have a dynamic type, which is, allows you to call anything on, on itself. And that is all checked in runtime. Uh, so you need some solution to that. And I'm not going to go into much details into that. But it's essentially reusing the same technology. You have some uh, stops that forward things and check things. Or you have multiple entry points into the function which bypass checks. Uh, and you use some static or dynamic analysis to determine which entry point you use. Uh, in the end, AOT compiler like, th this is what happened in the end. So AT compiler in usually is much faster now, like the code that it produces, much better. And the code is much faster. Uh, 
So that's almost the end of it. So there are some learnings I want to tell you, but I, I will overrun by two minutes. Is it okay? You're not going to kick me out, right? No? Okay, perfect. So we have 20 minutes between the talks, so two minutes I can overrun. So uh, what we learned is that if you're changing architecture, you usually think, oh, it's going to take one night. It takes two years. Uh, if you think it will take two days, it will take four probably. So, uh, so you better have your architecture structured in such a way that you have some parameters and it's not completely all fixed so that you can tweak it much easier. I mean, this is all basic stuff. Uh, most of the optimizations are more general than you think. Like, you, you think you can only apply inline caching for method calls. In reality, you can apply it for almost everything, including elimination of type checks of a covariant generics, uh, which you never anticipated when you started to implement it. Uh, there are still interesting problems in compiler technology to solve. Nobody writes about code size reductions. Everybody writes about how to make the tightest, smallest possible code, or how to JIT compile something. How do you do it in AOT context? How do you outline stuff? Like in LLVM, people are working on outlining, but in reality it's, uh, and Scala Native, I think, are also working on that, but it, there are very little uh, published about this. So if you're a student working in this area, this is a thing to focus on. Uh, and if you have your own compiler, don't ever write assembly by hand. If your compiler is incapable of producing reasonable code, retire. <laughs> so there is no thank you slide, but thank you for the attention. Uh, yeah.